uh, not um, gain not just uh, technical skill, but also confidence in the OR. Um, I know she spent uh, a few months recently over at the UF Health Shands here in Jacksonville, um, continue to develop her trauma skills as well. So uh, it's really been great seeing her develop into a fantastic surgeon. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing her talk on um, the final frontier. Thanks, Dr. Chen. Um, I guess with, with that, I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here if that's okay. All right. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. Okay. Well, thanks, Dr. Chen. It really means a lot <clears throat> to hear those words. I know I've spent a lot of time with you and, and others, and I really appreciate it. And I guess um, it's amazing over the course of my residency, I, I found myself interested in a lot of different things, which is sort of why I developed a general neurosurgery path. I had a hard time narrowing it down, but um, um, space medicine is something that um, I became interested in more recently over the past couple of years. And, and um, a lot of that credit goes to Dr., both Dr. Freeman's and uh, Dr. Michael Harrison. So uh, I thought uh, I would share what I've learned about space medicine over the past couple of years with you all. Um, and I know Dr. Q has mentioned the work that Dr. Zubair has done with stem cells and Dr. Freeman and and also our work um, with uh, glioblastoma in the microgravity environment. So here's another sort of spin and, and uh, on what we're doing in, in terms of our understanding of space medicine. Hopefully it'll uh, inspire and uh, encourage others to, to get involved. So um, my goal with this talk is really to just go over the, the history of what we know um, in space medicine and also how it relates to neurosurgery and neuroscientists. Uh, so with that, I'll get going. I have no disclosures for this uh, talk. And so I had a hard time sort of coming up with, you know, how can I explain to this group of people why space medicine and, and coming um, from me? I think um, I have a personal interest, not only um, being quite close to the Space Coast location, I have family there and I um, have been to a couple of launches um, down in Cape Canaveral and I highly recommend uh, anybody uh, uh, going down there and, and doing that is it's uh, quite an experience. And I sort of began to think, you know, what are we doing here at Mayo Clinic? Um, we're very close to the Space Coast and um, with all of the, the launches and the, um, I guess, uh, renewed interest in um, uh, uh, the Space Coast, I guess, launching, I, I, I just found that, you know, that, that interest, um, why is that interest not a little bit more robust here. And, and so I sort of dove into that um, with the help of Dr. Freeman. Um, I'm going to try to share just a, there's a history, a little bit of Mayo Clinic and also space innovation. And it started during World War II. And, and if you can't hear this, let me know, no big deal, but just a, a couple of a minute or two of, of some history here. And let me know if y'all cannot hear Only this. Only a few artifacts remain. However, the legacy of the wartime work of the Mayo Aeromedical Unit is substantial. A number of its innovations are still fundamental to aviation safety. The oxygen mask, the bailout bottle, full pressure suits, and much more. Today's G-suits operate on the same principle as the original. Every fighter pilot is still taught to combine the anti-G straining maneuver with the G-suit for his or her protection. The team's findings have also proven useful in cardiac Can you all hear or see that? Pulmonary function testing and other areas of contemporary medicine. I don't know if you all lost me there, but it sounds like it wasn't playing very well. Is that correct? We, we can hear the sound. Okay. I don't know if there was some movie or not, well, but the sound we can hear it. I apologize, the, the screen wasn't sharing, but um, long story short, basically Mayo Clinic um, um, was a, a part of the um, development of the G-suits, which the uh, fighter pilot jets and astronauts used to, to um, there was a problem with passing out during the, uh, the G-forces that they would take. And so uh, Mayo Clinic has a long history of developing um, uh, some of these uh, technologies to aid in that and directly involves our astronauts. In addition to why space medicine, um, as you all probably know, we've got this renewed interest in these billionaires in particular have started funding uh, 
space flight and space tourism. Um, and also, I think neurosurgery has a long history of pushing boundaries and in, in innovation and trying to predict dilemmas in medicine in the future. And I think we have a long history of that in, in uh, this field. And I think that should include space medicine as well. So the most important part, at least for me, for this talk and for you all is, is I think we should be aware of the brain physiology in response to space flight. And that's sort of what I wanna get across to you all today. And this was a recent paper and there are a lot of papers that are starting to come out about what we understand about the brain physics um, and how that relates um, to space flight and um, uh, neurosurgery. So some of the things that we'll be talking about are, are the things that we are starting to barely understand in terms of what that means in a microgravity environment. It includes CSF hydrodynamics, um, subdural hematomas with increasing age of astronauts um, and commercial space flight. What's going on in terms of intracranial pressure? And you'll hear me talk about this space flight associated neuroocular syndrome, SANS. Um, we're trying to understand back pain and, and how the, the spine changes in space flight. And there's this, there will be this unmet need. And we're starting to see that already in neurosurgery. How are we going to deal with things that go on in space, in particular as commercial space flight starts to occur? And, um, uh, we don't think about what, what would we do in an acute situation in, uh, in space, you know, but in particular these manned missions uh, to Mars, which is uh, the goal, um, at least currently, we, we need to start to think about how neuroscience and neurosurgery can play a part in this, because this is going to become, um, you know, part of what we're doing now and, and, and understanding what's going on will help aid in the safety and, and, uh, and the future of manned missions to Mars. So keep in mind, a round trip to Mars would last about two and a half years. It's a long time and, and we've actually never had a, a long duration space flight um, of that length. And when I say long duration, I mean more than six months or upwards of a year. And that's about as far as we've gotten in terms of being in space. But I'm going to rely a little bit on when I was first learning about what we do know currently on the human physiology of being in space. Uh, there was a really nice article published here, actually almost 10 years ago, but the authors here were all astronauts. And they sort of summarized nicely the things that they experienced in flight subjectively, but also objective inf information about what we already know. Um, so acclimation and space flight, um, there's a, a major shift in body fluids. Uh, in fact, there's a shift of body fluids towards the head during a, a takeoff. And actually pre-launch, if you remember in this, this previous picture, the, the legs here are situated uh, um, higher than they normally would in a seated position, essentially initiating this fluid shift before launch and space flight actually occurs. And there's a syndrome called puffy face bird leg syndrome where astronauts have this uh, facial fullness, uh, puffy appearance because they've had reduced volume in their lower extremities just from that shift. And in fact, when um, after astronauts come back, they say about 25% of them are really unable to stand for the first couple of hours due to lightheadedness, um, heart palpitations, syncope. And that's all because of this redistribution of the uh, the volume that goes on during the changes of the uh, gravity. There are a lot of studies that assess these effects on all different systems. Of course, we're going to focus here just on the so, uh, neuroscience portion, but I wanted you all to understand some of these things um, that I've learned as, as we go through this. Space motion sickness, it's a real thing. Most astronauts actually go through uh, neurovestibular acclimation um, uh, process during the first couple of days when they come into space um, and actually after they return to Earth. So we know that on Earth, motion sickness typically occurs when there's a mismatch between our neurovestibular system and our visual system. And astronauts actually report this when they're working in these weightlessness environments, um, especially during spacewalks, et cetera. But um, there's really no up or down to reference to. And if you think about it, it reminded me of um, things I've read about night scuba diving, where you can really easily lose that up and down um, and where you are in space. So space motion sickness is a, is a real thing. And typically most astronauts get better over the 
those first uh, couple of days, but it can persist throughout a mission. So just to give you all a little bit of a reference, um, uh, on a mission to the moon, for instance, most astronauts will experience about three days of micro microgravity, and once um, on the moon will actually adapt to this moon's gravitational force, which is 16% of Earth's. And for reference, Mars is about 38% of Earth's. So space motion sickness is something we need to, to think about as well, and that will have factors in terms of actually performing surgery as well in space later on. Muscle atrophy, it's a real thing. So without that need to um, support yourself upright against gravity, um, your postural muscles actually atrophy um, due to this absence of gravitational load. And actually after a couple of weeks, uh, muscle mass in astronauts uh, diminishes substantially. Um, and they predict that on longer missions of, of about three to six months, about 30% of, of that muscle mass has, has atrophied. Um, after uh, astronauts come back to Earth, they typically struggle with a lot of uh, soreness in their muscles and, and, and many of them report plantar fasciitis. So some of the things that they try to do to um, combat this is there's a pretty um, rigorous uh, workout regimen on the um, International Space Station. In fact, they have to do two hours of daily workouts and that's really to offset this muscle atrophy, that uh, process that goes on without that uh, gravitational load that you and I get just by walking around here on Earth. In the same sense, bone demineralization is, is a, a problem as well. And so again, lack of gravity, reduced ambient light, meaning less vitamin D3 levels and skeletal remodeling, there's this loss of calcium that occurs. And they measure this with um, um, a lot of blood work and urine samples. And they think this occurs really early in space flight. Um, and actually after about six months on the International Space Station, the studies that they've done on these astronauts is that they've lost about eight to 12% of their bone density. So for example, if you think about a round trip, remember that's two and a half years to Mars there and back, it could, um, they, they think that it, if we don't have ways to, to treat this or to offset it, it could deteriorate bone to osteoporotic levels so much that um, even returning to earth, they might, astronauts might not be able to rebuild um, bone. And so, because even on the shorter duration flights, it's sometimes up to three years for them to uh, sort of see that pre-flight bone density. So that's a real problem. And these were things that as I was learning about this, I was like, wow, there's a lot of, a lot of risks, obviously outside of the basic ones, just getting to space that are there for astronauts. Immune dysregulation, we're still trying to understand this. Um, about a half of Apollo of the Apollo astronauts reported infections during flight. And this might be just a part of the stress response that goes on during um, launch and just being in space in general. And there's there have been some astronauts that have this reactivation of a latent herpes infection. Um, and they have monitored their um, uh, uh, cellular Im immune um, function have found there to be some impairment. And I'll go into a little bit more detail um, further into the talk. Um, they, they know that essentially these natural killer cells and T cells in astronauts are altered. We're not necessarily sure yet the implications of this. Um, and then of course, ionizing radiation. Remember space is not just about being in a, a microgravity environment. There's more, you coming out of, of the protection of the Earth's atmosphere, you're exposed to the sun's radiation and to these um, uh, gamma ray, this exposure, we just don't know what it, uh, the role that it plays on our immune system. Um, and also think about it when, when they launch things to space, uh, it's not like they have to make sure it's a very sterile uh, process and sending something to the International Space Station, um, you don't want to send the common cold um, up there. So we don't really know the long-term effects of being in a sterile environment where you and I, we walk around and as we're young, we're exposed to infections, we build an immune system. And so these are things even outside of, of the conversation of microgravity in space that we're just starting to understand and think about. Well, speaking of space radiation, what does that even mean? I know when I first started reading about it, I was like, well, how can I relate that to what I know about radiation being in the operating room. I know as I work with Dr. Chen and doing minimally invasive spine surgery, we use a lot of x-ray and we wear protective devices for that. But what does that mean? What is space radiation? And, and they use this um, millisieverts. It's a form of measurement 
And space radiation really includes different high energy particles and these galactic cosmic rays that you and I are protected um, by when we're on Earth. And so for entrant, for sort of um, to relate this to what astronauts experience versus you and I, one millisievert is about three chest X-rays and astronauts, depending on how long they're in space, can range from five to 2000 millisieverts. And NASA actually predicts that there is a risk of death from these, this space flight induced cancers to be around 3%. But again, another thing that we're just sort of learning about and how is that going to affect us in terms of long duration space flight and what we know about this. So does anybody want to be an astronaut at this point? <laughs> I know these guys are really excited. This was, I believe, off of the uh, crew at two. Um, and so even knowing all of these risks involved, um, um, these guys uh, still want to go to space. But knowing some of this stuff, it's, it's really interesting to see the, the uh, courage that a lot of these uh, men and women have um, to explore. But the, the paper that I referred to early, uh, earlier, this was a nice summary of some of those things. So you can see the sort of time course of where a lot of these effects take place and this fluid redistribution, you can see it can increase over the, or it can remain over the course of a, a month, upwards of a month, but a lot of that shift occurs during the first uh, couple of days in space. Um, the psychosocial effects as well, I didn't touch base on that, but we know those are there. Fatigue, sleep debt, isolation, and there's a lot of stress in terms of the astronaut's family. So those are things to consider from a neuroscience um, standpoint as well. But that's just a nice summary of, of the, the paper there and, and how that relates to um, um, in-flight and also post-flight. Um, here, here's a study that a lot of people refer to, and this is a, a, a very interesting study. It was called the NASA Twin Study, and it was actually an analysis of a, a year-long um, uh, human spaceflight study with twins, Mark and Scott Kelly. And it was published in uh, Science in 2019. And when this study was published, of course, since then that we've had more people go into space, but there were only 559 humans um, who had flown with only eight of these on long duration missions, which they referred to as more than 300 days. So not a whole lot. And so they picked Mark and Scott, um, they're identical twins for this first year, one year mission to compare the impact of of Scott and space and, and Mark um, on earth. And of course they were genetically matched. And um, the culmination was a 340 day mission where Scott stayed on the International Space Station during that time. And both were 50 years of age and they actually both were astronauts before and they had about four years um, between their last space flight. And as you would think, they took samples during for of both twins um, throughout this process of a year, both pre-flight, um, in-flight on, on Scott's way to uh, the space station, also post-flight. And they looked at all of these different areas, molecular level, genetics, um, physiologically, cognitive um, tests were done. And they actually classified sort of um, 10 um, sort of areas and they, they put them into what NASA believes are low risk, medium or unknown risks and high risk things during space flight. And they basically, use this well do these symptoms persist after six months post-flight and scott compared to mark and that's how they sort of classified um, what they what they think are low versus high risk um, impacts of being in a microgravity environment potentially low risks they said that they they basically looked at measure they measured gene function and Again, I, I think I mentioned earlier that there were some changes in those natural killer um, cells and uh, uh, CD4 and CD8 cells during space flight, and that about 91% of these actually changed some expression, but they returned to normal um, within six months after return to Earth. So again, we're not really, really sure what this means, but we know that there are some changes. They actually gave uh, both twins a vaccination um, while uh, Scott was on the International Space Station, and he actually um, did give an immune uh, response to this vaccination. They didn't specify which one it was, but um, they did sort of use this as some evidence that the primary immune functions were maintained. There's also a change in the telomere um, function, both um, it elongates and it actually shortens, and I'll tell you about that, but initially Scott had this sort of short duration of telomere lengthening. And if you don't know, the telomeres, basically it's a DNA structure that preserves our genome information and it can 
um, help us understand aging, et cetera. But um, they think that Scott, uh, he had this reduced body mass. Remember his muscles were atrophied and uh, in space. And they, they think that might've had a correlation with his, his increase in telomere lengthening, but they're unsure. There were a lot of microbiome changes between the two twins. And uh, they think that obviously there might've been some changes, even though they were had probably very strict protocols in some of the dietary differences between the two. So um, we're, they're unable to really comment more on that. So potentially mid-level and unknown risk was this collagen regulation. Um, they looked that at, at Scott and he at, basically had an increased excretion in his urine of these collagen molecules. And remember that loss of gravity meant that there was a different load on his cartilage and his bone and how he was um, moving around. And so uh, Scott actually also remember collagen is a part of our vascular system and he had some remodeling of his carotid artery and actually had an increase in this intima uh, medial thickening. And they weren't able to really say much more about it, but they just noticed those changes. And then of course, as you know, there were, there were some changes in the fluid uh, balance in the ships and uh, Scott had increased, remember he's the one in space, Scott had increased plasma sodium levels um, in the microgravity environment. And, and they said that was possibly due to maybe a change in, in hydration level between the two. And they recommend in the future that we monitor this urine um, AQP2 level to basically look at how we control water transport. Unable to comment more on that, but that was the conclusion of the NASA study here. Um, and then again, I mentioned that Scott had this rap, this sort of short duration telomere elongation, but after he came back, there was a persistent telomere loss. And so after he came back, essentially, they don't know if it was due to the extreme stress of, of the flight and post-flight, um, but uh, essentially he had shortening of his telomere. And um, they have noticed this on other astronauts um, during um, shorter uh uh, stays on the International Space Station, and they these astronauts uh, tend to have significantly shorter telomeres after flight, which is obviously different than that that short increase in telomere lengthening, which seems great at first, but then post flight when they're back on Earth, um, this is kind of concerning. And, and as I already said, these are the telomeres are their markers of aging and age related diseases like cancer and cardiovascular disease. So potentially high risk things that came out of this study, and this is something I mentioned earlier, is this space flight associated neuroocular syndrome, SANS. And about 40% of astronauts have experienced this um, uh, uh, syndrome, essentially where they have uh, issues with their eyes and vision headaches. And what they found is that astronauts actually have optic disc edema and globe flattening, increased in choroidal folds. And they think that this is based on changes in intracranial pressure? Is this the microgravity induced shift of fluids towards the head? And, and again, there's no relief of this fluid towards the head in the microgravity environment. And they actually have done fundoscopy and they, they show this optic disc edema um, um, before flight to in flight. And actually some of these astronauts never recover pre-flight levels. And they look at these things with like retinal nerve fiber layer thickening. Um, that sometimes we see when we ask our ophthalmologists to assess some of our patients who have increased intracranial pressure or concerns for papilledema. So this is a, something that's talked about quite a bit in the literature and potentially high risk change. I, I mentioned the vascular changes that Scott had in flight. And so they know that there's this increased um, carotid intima media thickness and vascular stiffness. And um, they don't know if this poses a higher risk of um, cerebrovascular disease in the lifetime of an astronaut. And then overall, there's this genomic instability. And Scott had increased chromosomal translocations during flight and actually remained after he came back to Earth after that year. And this has been consistent with other studies that have really shown this ongoing genome instability and re rearrangement. So we don't know what that means. And they actually labeled this as high risk. So even after one year, this persisted. So we've got a lot, a lot to go in terms of understanding what this means. And NASA has actually announced this plan for a Mars mission and this cis lunar station or cis being um, near the moon called the Lunar Gateway. They wanna build another station there, which will basically provide new opportunities to um, send astronauts up and have people stay there for a long duration. They'll be somewhat close to Earth, but um, they recommended or they essentially said we're doing this to understand what long duration space actually means in the future.
so for those of us who are in a neurosurgery, neuroscience, you know, how does this relate now to, you know, CNS pathology? And I mentioned these intracranial pressure changes and astronauts have actually reported this SANS, this syndrome, which essentially they have visual disturbances, headaches, nausea, vomiting, they, they deal with space motion sickness or vertigo. And they, they, they think that this is likely due to increased intracranial pressure from this shift towards the head. And other theories include maybe an increase in carbon dioxide combined in, in this cabin in the International Space Station. Is there a role of radiation that's causing um, trouble uh, in terms of um, uh, the sands? And also is this due to jugular vein compression and backflow um, in the loss of uh, gravity? Head trauma, there's been no documentations of a head trauma or even spine trauma in space. However, remember astronauts do a lot of spacewalks if they're repairing things and, and they don't, um, they retain their mass even though they're in um, weightlessness. Remember they retain their mass. So there's definitely risk there and debris as well. So these are some of the things that us as neurosurgeons should be thinking of. And what about the spine? Actually, there was a study in 2016 um, that found that the likelihood of herniated cervical and lumbar discs in astronauts was up four times after space flight. Um, and actually post-flight cervical disc herniations were up almost three times greater than lumbar disc herniations. And why is that the case? There's actually, um, they have shown that the spine lengthens during flight. And this is um, obviously there's no loading from the lack of gravity and, or the, I should say microgravity. And they think the lumbar spine can sort of swell. They get this hyperhydration or a lot more blood flow comes into the disc um, due to unloading of the spine and, it, and there's um, an increased intervertebral distancing. And so um, considering the bony demineralization and disc changes, as I have said here, there's an increased susceptibility to fractures, um, uh, compression fractures, and of course, disc herniations in a lot of these astronauts just from these changes. So what about surgery in space? So, you know, we're, we're just touching on the things that we know of. What about treatment uh, modalities? And the current protocol really for emergencies include bringing back crew members to earth, essentially. And there's actually been um, uh, two non-traumatic surgical emergencies in Russian astronauts. In fact, one was actually returned to earth. And some of the literature and authors have suggested that we should do prophylactic appendectomies and cholecystectomies for astronauts uh, prior to flight to sort of avoid these maybe unforeseen um, surgical emergencies that would occur during um, space. And again, there's been no documented, documented head injuries. However, there's some evidence that traumatic or spontaneous hemorrhage may be increased in space. So traumatic hemorrhage, increased risk of this. Also, uh, they have suggested maybe a pre-flight angiogram to rule out an aneurysm or vascular ab abnormality in people that are going to space. And these are just in our astronauts. This doesn't even touch on what commercial uh, or space tourism would suggest meaning just anybody going up in, into space. So we, we need to be thinking about these things and how we can um, be a part of this conversation because I think there's a lot there that we are just starting to understand. And actually there was this um, mission uh, years ago in 1998, it was called this NeuroLab shuttle mission where they did perform surgery um, uh, on the space station. It was, um, it was on rats. And they actually documented a craniotomy, um, a laminectomy, a laparotomy, and they didn't go into a ton of detail, at least in the paper, but the rats were essentially under um, general anesthesia and they closed the wounds. Um, they got hemostasis and um, they actually uh, reported that it was an increased operative time due to the difficulty to restrain surgical supplies and instruments um, with the lack of gravity or microgravity. Um, uh, two of the astronauts were actually physicians, and one of them had a couple of years of surgical training, but, you know, this was just a small study on rats, and they actually performed these surgeries in these general purpose workstations on the Columbia shuttle here and then beyond, and it was a glove box that basically enclosed the animals and hardware for isolation from this actual uh, atmosphere, and it had two arm portals. I'll show you a picture of that. And they use this closed air circulation loop with activated charcoal canisters to control the odors and eliminate. And you can see these guys here, it's a small, this sort of workstation here, he's, he's actually wearing loops. And 
they um i mean if you're on the uh, shuttle or the international space station there are a lot of these hooks to put your feet as you're moving around you can see it's a very small space but inside of here so the operator hooks his feet in he sticks his arms in here and the rat is actually held down on a table with velcro and there um, the instruments were put with velcro on the sides of this workstation but again this is if you could imagine what are we going to do with human surgery and this was just a very small uh, uh, study to look at what we possibly could do in terms of surgery in space. So this was pretty interesting um, to see this. Well, what about diagnosing neurosurgical issues in space? And really ultrasound has been the only advanced modality that they've trialed on the International Space Station. And you know, with ultrasound, you can estimate intracranial pressure. And that's important, remember, because of SANS. Astronauts have these vision changes, and they think it's due to um, compliance um, in the brain. And, and they've actually used ultrasound to measure, as we, we do on Earth, to measure the optic nerve sheath diameter, which can correlate with high intracranial pressure. So performing a lumbar puncture on Earth, which we do if we have a concern sometimes about the ICPs, they've never been able to do this in space. It's, it's too risky, essentially. They've done it um, pre and post flight. But if you think about it, think about the engorgement of the lumbar venous plexus, in addition to just the basic risks of, of developing subarachnoid hemorrhage or meningitis. Yeah, and also, the how could we actually do that in the microgravity environment with having the patient positioned and whatnot. So there's, there's no advanced imaging in space, like a CAT scan or an MRI. And the cost of even launching this is astronomical. And it's pretty much weight-based, but a CT for reference would be 44 million. And they estimate an MRI in space would be 500 million. So that's not really in the cards as of yet. So we have to be thinking of other ways. So in saying that, Dr. Dr. The Dr. Freemans and, and Dr. Harrison and actually Tito and myself um, were wondering how could we um, contribute to the literature of understanding, you know, what's going on in terms of the intracranial pressure um, in a microgravity environment. And so, as you already know, and as I've told you, we know that um, there's problems um, with intracranial pressure relative to this microgravity environment. And this question of SANS raises that question of what's going on globally in terms of intracranial pressure. Um, ultrasound has been used for optic nerve sheath diameter in flight, but invasive measures are challenging. And so transcranial Doppler is something you and I, um, at least the neurosurgical team, we use it uh, quite a bit in our um, subarachnoid hemorrhage patients. And we use that to assess intracranial compliance and elasticity. And it got us thinking, you know, how could we use transcranial Doppler or sort of suggest using this in astronauts to um, think about uh, intracranial compliance and elasticity changes going on? It seems to be a relati relatively um, low uh, complex or the complexity of it is you can teach somebody and it's also would be much cheaper than obviously having a, a CT scan or, or less risky than doing a lumbar puncture. And so we searched the data, the databases here that NASA and the National Library of Medicine looking for, um, you know, other studies that have looked at TCDs. And then we, we found one head down study on earth that looked at uh, transcranial Doppler and ICPs. And then we said, well, how can we relate this to astronauts? We can't do this study right now on astronauts, but what are some patients that we use TCDs on um, that have intracranial uh, pressure issues? And, and we thought about, um, looking at patients that have had aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, which get TCDs usually during their stay. Um, and some of them can um, have delayed hydrocephalus and come back and need a, a shunt placed. So we thought, well, these might be patients we could tease out the ones that had EVDs and TCDs during their um, hospital stay and sort of look and see if any of those patients came back and, and had a shunt placed and did the TCDs, if we actually go back and look at that, did the TCDs give some, in, I guess, inference as to those patients maybe would be at risk of having trouble with intracranial compliance. And so um, using transcranial Doppler, uh, there are two indices that we looked at for this study, and it's called the resistance and pulsatility indices. And um, these have actually been shown to correlate with increased ICPs on earth. And for those of you who are interested in just the um, I guess how they're defined here, there are subtle differences, but long story short, resistance and pulsatility index basically reflect vascular resistance. And um, a high pulsatility index, for instance, can be indicative of narrowing of small vessels. And, um, and that could sort of tip you off as some sort of problem in terms of elasticity or compliance, which might indicate intracranial pressure issues. 
And a recent study actually from um, last year looked at 40 patients and they were consented for um, uh, uh, ETVs or shunts for hydrocephalus. And actually during the placement or the where they put the shunt in and CSF came out or they put um, the dilator in for this endoscopic uh, third ventriculostomy, um, they actually measured TCDs during that and it correlated significantly with the PI correlated on that TCD measurement um, with the high ICP that came out in real time. So we know that this is something that's uh, meaningful. And so basically to, to sort of um, summarize this, we were interested in patients who came back and needed shunts placed. And we said, well, did these patients while they were in the hospital have elevated PI slash RI values? And we found five patients who had delayed hydrocephalus, who were in our hospital, had EVDs, had TCDs, had the EVDs taken out and came back at some point um, uh, after the, the next couple of months and came back and actually had to have shunts placed. And they all had elevated PI and RI values during their hospital stay, which raises that question about you know, what's going on. And so TCDs, essentially we said, well, TCDs with these RI and PI indices may be a non-invasive way with you know, high accessibility for astronauts to use this on the International Space Station. Um, they can do it in flight, um, they can do it pre-flight and post-flight, and you can look at this and say, you might be able to predict what's going on in terms of the brain, in addition to what they're already doing with optic nerve sheath diameter and this sort of evidence of optic disc edema. So that was our study we presented at the International Space Station Research and Development Conference, um, and so we hope to continue that um, work in the future. And so to sort of I guess, bring this all together towards the end, what does this mean for the future um, in terms of neurosci neuroscience, neurosurgery and space flight? And so, you know, again, these current modalities include just ultrasound and ATLS protocols. We don't really have a good idea what severe bleeding or other uh, neurosurgical emergencies look like in microgravity. Open surgery, I just mentioned that, would patients have to be restrained? Yes, um, surgeons, they would have to be restrained. Supplies would as well. What does that look like? I don't know if any of you have saw this movie on Netflix, but what, what does microgravity do to exposed internal bleeding? I mean, this was you know pretty wild to see, but I mean, it's not that far off due to the surface tension of blood. Um, it can pool and may fragment off and, and basically float within the cabin. So these are real issues, even though I know that they're they're made this way in Hollywood, but these are things we're trying to figure out. So here's an artist um, rendition of what maybe a trauma pod or some sort of capsule you can see here, maybe on the International Space Station of what that looks like. It's sort of an enclosed space here. Um, and then you've got the patient strapped in, you've got the operator here, and then maybe a robot here. And so we're already starting to draw things and figure out ways that we might be able to operate in space. We think that maybe minim minimally invasive surgery or endoscopic techniques um, will play a role in surgery in space. Um, they think that laparoscopic surgery is a solution to contain anatomy um, because it eliminates, of course, large openings. But again, we don't know what the insufflation of uh, carbon dioxide within the body looks like. What about robotic surgery? I know as I work with Dr. Chen, we're doing a lot of robotic um, uh, T-lifts and you know, how can robotics um, play a role in maybe the future of surgery in space? And it's possible that a robot might negate the need of uh, physical presence of the surgeon. Of course, if you think about it, there's, there's that risk of loss of signal and delay. And the distance between Earth and Mars is about, you know, 48 a million miles. And there's a signal delay, as you can see, of four to 22 minutes for radio signals. And this really isn't feasible yet, but it might be something we can consider maybe on this cis lunar station um, or lunar gateway that NASA is talking about building 3D printing. I know um, we just, we, uh, Dr. Q uh, showed a picture of Dr. Clifton. His work was in 3D printing. And, you know, maybe we could carry this on board to print surgical instruments since there's a limited need for space. And also you could um, dispose of the surgical instruments afterwards. So surgery in space um, really will have all of the same risks here, plus microgravity challenges. And in addition, astronauts and surgeons who are astronauts may experience these other syndromes of um, the acclimation process in space, include, including dexterity issues, coordination issues, neurovestibular disturbances um, during long duration space flight. So 
you know, to sort of conclude, here was another um, artist uh, rendition in a paper I relied heavily on in terms of my learning um, early on. And, and this is a, a, an area on Mars here that maybe they've eliminated the microgravity issue, but it shows these pods and here's an MRI here. And this, this is something that, you know, we're already starting to think about what, what's it going to look like um, on Mars. So I think we've got a lot um, to learn. And I think that um, a trip to Mars is going to happen, you know, probably during our lifetime. But what does that mean? I think we've got a lot of problems. And I think um, neuroscientists, neurosurgeons, and um, uh, should be very involved in, in space medicine. Um, because if we want to ever populate another planet, we're going to have to solve the issue of what medicine looks like. And, and I think that's a really interesting thing to be a part of. And I think that's why it's sort of the next uh, uh, maybe even final frontier of neurosurgery is to, to be a part of this. So in saying that, I just want to thank Dr. both Dr. Freeman's um, who've been um, really instrumental in, in my interest and, and hopefully future developments even beyond my residency here, Dr. Mike Harrison, who splits his time I know here and, and also at SpaceX. And then of course my references, which I can share with anybody, but I'll conclude there, I suppose, in the interest of time. So thank you very much. Well, thanks, Kelly, for that uh, great talk. Um, actually, really uh, exciting to hear what, you know, possibilities may lay out there. But of course, a lot of questions that remain unanswered with regards to both normal physiology in space, as well as pathophysiology in space and how we can manage, um, you know, the different stressors on the human body uh, in zero gravity and also actually um, you know, the forces it's subjected to in escaping Earth's atmosphere and Earth's gravitational pull. Um, you know, you, you talked a little bit about um, uh, spinal issues that arise uh, after, um, uh, uh, after traveling to space. I wonder if it's a combination of, you know, the demineralization of the bone, um, the atrophy of the paraspinal musculatures, and the hyperhydration of the disc spaces that uh, kind of leads to this lack of adequate support when re-entering Earth's, uh, Earth's uh, gravitational pull. And, um, you know, maybe that leads to all of the spinal pathology that you see in patients returning to Earth. Yeah, I know. I found that very interesting as well when I was learning about this. We think so much of, um, you know, all the other basic problems that they have just getting to space, but I, I never thought about it in terms of what happens in the spine. So there's definitely risk there. And, and they think, of course, it's because of that elongation of the, the intervertebral um, disc space. And so it puts astronauts at risk of having um, problems and also the bony demineralization and an atrophy of the muscles that they have higher risk of compression fractures and osteoporosis. So what does that mean for you and I, if we ever want to go to space, you know, we're just, you know, not, not even astronauts. So I think it's definitely something we, we have a lot of work to do on in terms of understanding and, and playing a role in that in the future. Interesting. It looks like uh, Gaetano just mentioned that uh, Jeff Bezos takes some prolia before his trip for patients, uh, for uh, people who don't know, prolia um, is uh, an inhibitor of uh, osteoclasts, so prevents uh, bone resorption, which um, uh, I didn't realize that Jeff Bezos was aware of uh, bone uh, physiology going into space, so that's great to hear. Um, any other questions from the uh, group at all? I, my only comment, uh, Kelly, wonderful talk, a lot of comments about a lot of people you can see in the chat. I think that from my perspective, one of the things that is surprising to me and, uh, and quite fascinating is looking at the preliminary data and the role of microgravity and cancer cell migration. And that's Powell eventually is going to be presenting that data or in the ability of mesenchym stem cells from fat to proliferate and to continue to be, you know, in a state of uh, early differentiation. It's quite fascinating. And I, I think that we're, be, we're gonna understand the role, it seems, at least from the preliminary data, that it may promote in cancer, uh, faster migration, invasion, and things like that. We have no idea how this is affected. And we don't know if it's the effects of radiation, combination of lack of gravity, but nonetheless, I think that this is, as you said, the unexplored frontier, what happens to our astronauts, but also how can we take advantage of that to learn about the pathophysiology of human diseases. So fascinating talk. I want to thank you for putting such a great and thoughtful presentation with your data as well.
No, thank you. Yeah, and of course, Dr. Freeman, both of you, um, Michelle and, and Dr. Freeman, um, played a major role in, in my interest. And we've got a lot of work to do, I think. And, and hopefully, if anybody else is interested, I know we've got a little space medicine group that uh, you know we email and we try to get together. And so, more than happy to to share that. I know Dr. Freeman would as well. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Gassi, and I know Dr. Q's book. Uh, you know, becoming Dr. Q talks about his interest in space and um, the origins of this lecture series too. And yeah, I think there's a group with Rowan and Cesar will continue the work together. So thank you. Beautiful work. Excellent. Good. Well, have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Salve, for, for monitoring and, and serving as a coordinator and MC for this wonderful talk. And thank you, Kelly, for putting it together and showing the data as well. All right. Thank Take you. Have a great week. We'll see everybody during the week. A great Friday too. Bye bye.